Welcome to Alpha Centurion. I'll be your guide. Today, we're going to be looking at Dr. Gavin Ortland. I'm going to be really honest. I really like uh, Dr. Ortland. Um, I used to listen to a lot of uh, Protestant pastors, Baptist pra pastors um, back in the day, especially when I was forming uh, or reforming my faith after being away from the church for a long time. And a lot of them were just hate mongers. They were terrible and, and their apologetics were terrible and their theology was not well formed. Um, one of my go to or two of my go to people to counter on this channel and in my personal life is just James White and um, Mike Winger because they're they just they don't know what they're talking about. Dr. Gavin Ortland does know what he's talking about. His arguments against Catholicism are really strong. His arguments for uh, Calvinism, his arguments for, um, let's say, bat, uh, Baptistism. I don't even know what that would be called. His, his, Baptist, his arguments for Protestantism, let's put it that way, are very, very good. Um, and recently, a I think the guy's name uh, Cameron something. I don't know. Uh, he has another channel capturing Christianity. It's kind of a very light kind of fluffy Christian apologetics channel, but it's very simple. So there's not a lot. He doesn't get a lot wrong. He just doesn't really overly commit to any one view. Recently, he's been coming more to Catholicism. The questions I'm about to ask are from one of those videos where they were talking about arguments against the papacy or against the papal office. This video is not directed to Cameron at all. There are much better, much more popular, much more well-read, much more well-educated Catholics who are working on that on his conversion. So that's not what this video is about. This video is directed directly to Gavin Ortland, who I've interacted with a little bit on his channel uh, through comments, not like he doesn't know who I am. But I really, really respect the guy. I really like his arguments for Christianity, his arguments for uh, Calvinism and his arguments for Protestantism. I'll be honest, his arguments for Protestant Protestantism are better than uh, Calvin's and better than, uh, in all honesty, better than Luther's. I've read Luther's stuff. I wasn't impressed. Um, Ortland's stuff is great. Okay. I say that to say this. I don't agree with Gavin's objections to the papacy or to the papal office. Um, I don't understand, and I'm speaking directly to Gavin, not that he'll ever hear this. But I don't understand how it being a development makes it non-existent. So let's say that the seed of the papal office is on this rock, I will build this church. Okay, let's say that's the seed. So in Acts, in the Gospels, there is the seed of the papal office, okay? And historically, there are different patriarchs that would be called Pope. So let's say that originally Peter was the first among equals and apostolic succession is real and each of the five patriarchate was actually who they say they were. So jo the Johannian seat is coming from from, from there, James is coming from James. So you have Antioch, you have Jerusalem, you have, um, I don't know, pick another one, Ethiopia, you have the church in India. So each, you know, you have a Mathian, a Petrine, a Lucian, the tradition of who founded which church. And you have Peter founding two churches. You have Paul and Peter getting martyred and them being martyred in Rome, which makes them the founders of the Roman church through martyrdom, not through actually being that initial bishop, regardless of whether or not they held that office, but being the founders of that church through martyrdom, even though the church had already existed. And this, there's precedence for this in uh, the Christian tradition, that the first martyr is sometimes considered the first bishop or the first minister to a church area. I can't give you the exact book, but I know I read that when I was reading through the Church Fathers, is that that kind of tradition does exist. Okay, so we now have the budding. Is the, so you have the planting of the seed in the Gospels, in Acts, 
then you have the the watering if you will through the martyr's blood so now it's going to come forth then you have the um maybe you can say clement but the point is that you don't have a church without a bishop which means that if there was a church in rome there was a bishop now you can argue that there was a council that was in charge or had a little bit more power or that had a little bit more power than whatever person or individuals identified as the bishop of rome but an identifying mark of the early church is the bishop. So we get through uh, the reading, we, we, you know, we read through Irenaeus, we read through all of that, we read through Ignatius, we get through, okay, let's just get through all that. And then you have the Mongol invasion and you have this established office that's part of the patriarch, this part of the patriarchy, that's part of the people holding power in these churches. And you have the Pope striking peace with the Huns or Attila the Hun leave. Now he rises up in popular power. Then you have what's going on in the Eastern church. You have the political struggles and tension with Empress Theodora around 548 and Empress Irene around 797 leading up to the great schism in 1053. So you have this weird convalence where the patriarchs lose political power while the pope in rome gains political power and now the pope is going to gain theological power okay so we have a seed we have a watering we have a a budding and now we have the stem now we have the growth of it and then from there as the other patriarchs get trimmed away during the season of weeding and cultivating as other branches get trimmed away, leaving only the Catholic Church as that strong, solid trunk for Christianity by the Muslim invasions. And now by this Muslim conquest, there is the 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 other valid apostolic traditions and rites the other branches the other whatever you want to say are gone to where now just the papal office in rome is the only one being fed is the only one who's who's growing grows stronger because it's getting all the nutrients from all the believers and it becomes even stronger until you get to vatican one and you have yourself a true supremacy not just at first among equals but now you have the only free speaking patriarch as the rest are under subjugation and under exile from their own lands because of the Islamic conquest in the East. Why isn't that proof or an argument for the legitimacy of the papacy? Again, this is directly to Gavin Ortland. Someone else wants to answer this, that's fine. Um, I just, I really want to know what your opinion on this, man. What, what your opinion on this is, man. Um, and like I said, I've interacted with you before. I really, really respect you. I really like your stuff. Um, so I hope you answer this. Um, if you don't, no problem. Uh, but uh, if you do, I really look forward to hearing from you. Uh, okay.